Okay, I think we will have some more people coming in, but I want to welcome you to the breakout session titled The Challenge of Special Education, Illiteracy and Behavior. My name is Debbie Thome. I'm an advocate with Disability Rights North Carolina. Um, April, who's not in here right now? <laughs> April Dancola um, and Chris in the back will be helping um, me make sure that you have the support you need for this session and help you with any accommodations you may need. So please ask one of us if you need something. We encourage you to leave feedback on the evaluation forms for this session that are left on the tables. Um, you can leave them on the table after you fill them out or drop them in the box at the registration table or skip the writing and submit your evaluation online. It's another option we give you. And I believe there are links in your packets for that. Um, I would like to recognize Education NC who generously sponsored this breakout session. Education NC is a newly formed nonprofit organization that seeks to involve all North Carolinians in the expansion of educational opportunities for all children in our state. If you have a question during the session today, please use the microphone. I believe Chris will be available to bring it to you if you need him to do that. Um, just raise your hand. Someone will bring you the microphone. We have a very experienced panel of attorneys presenting to you today. Chris Trottier is a senior attorney who leads our work on behalf of students with disabilities. Chris has represented students for over 30 years. Lisa Rabin is a senior attorney and she and Chris have worked together for more than 12 years. Virginia Fogg is the newest member of our team and an attorney. And before joining Disability Rights North Carolina, Virginia represented students with special needs for six years in private practice. And I promised them that I was going to tell you that I can do the math. And between them, they have about 70 years of legal experience. So when we say very experienced, that's what we mean. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Chris Trottier. Thank you, Debbie. Um, Debbie didn't include herself. Uh, she's an advocate with our team, and she has 30 years of experience. So we're up to 100. Um, the education team uh, represents uh, at-risk students having disabilities. Our clients are long-term suspended, they're failing academically, and depending upon their age, they're pushed into the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system. Um, when I describe our clients as at risk, I'm identifying students who by virtue of circumstances um, are, at, are likely to drop out of school and uh, join the school to prison pipeline. And those circumstances include poverty, disability, illiteracy, and structural disadvantages such as inequitable school funding. Um, schools don't have enough resources um, to do um, what they're mandated to do. Um, how many have worked with at-risk students? Okay, uh, then you're familiar with uh, many of our clients. Um, our clients are often long-term suspended for reasons related to their disability and their reading problems. Um, we provide, we represent and pro provide advocacy on behalf of our clients based on a federal special education statute known as IDEA, which is an acronym for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. How many are familiar with IDEA? Okay. Um, for special education students who are suspended, IDEA requires school systems to provide behavioral supports under specific circumstances, such as functional behavioral assessments, behavior intervention plans, and Ginny and Lisa will be covering that um, with their presentation. Okay. Um, this, the focus of my presentation is reading. We rely on IDEA as a vehicle for addressing our clients' reading problems because illiteracy is the biggest predictor for high school dropout and the school to prison pipeline. How many are familiar with the school to prison pipeline? Good. It's a popular term used to describe 
of the pattern of pushing students out of school into the juvenile justice system or the criminal justice system. For many of our clients, their behavior problems are related to their disabilities, but are also related um, uh, to their reading problems. And for us, one way to address long-term suspensions and the school-to-prison pipeline is to promote a literacy to school pipeline. And we try to do that with our cases. We know this, but we don't know this. You know, in the primary uh, grades, from kindergarten to third grade, um, students are learning to read. But then after third grade, they have to read to learn. And so when a child's reading difficulties are allowed to continue, the children's problems only get worse. Uh, it, and it negatively impacts their behavior, it negatively impacts their thinking, it negatively impacts their self-image. And so when a student has not learned to read, they have not learned the subjects in the curriculum required for high school graduation. So literacy is really a crucial component for anyone to successfully navigate school and adult life. The skills identified here are described as the building blocks for reading. And in elementary school, these discrete skills are taught because these specific skills are the foundation for reading. Phonemic, by the way, if people have questions, not about specific cases, but if they have questions during the presentation, just raise your hand and um, you'll be given a microphone. Phonemic awareness is the first skill, and it is the ability to hear and identify the individual sounds and spoken words. Before we learn to read, we need to be able to hear and work with the sounds and words. So the phoneme, or phoneme is described as the smallest part of a sound in a spoken word that makes a difference in the meaning of the word. So for example, hat versus pat. Children who cannot work with, who don't acquire phonemic awareness are going to struggle with reading and they're going to struggle with learning how to spell. The second skill is phonics. And phonics is the understanding that there is a predictable relationship between phonemes or between graphemes and phonemes, which means that children learn there is a relationship between written letters and spoken words. We need to have an understanding of phonics in order to be able to decode words. Phonics also gives us an appreciation of the alphabet system, which helps us learn words. Oh, I think so. Um, but for a child to learn phonics, they have to have phonemic awareness because if they can't hear the sounds, they're not going to be able to connect the sounds that they hear to the letters of the word. So after phonics, children learn to become fluent readers, which means that and I'm approaching this as a linear way because this is the way I learned it in preparation for this presentation. Um, I'm not a reading specialist. And uh, if people have other ideas or um, uh, to clarify what I'm saying or what the PowerPoint, raise your hand. Um, fluent readers recognize words and comprehend at the same time because they have the ability to read a text accurately and quickly. Fluency is like a bridge. It's a bridge between word recognition and comprehension. And less fluent readers um, focus on decoding so they don't have the attention to understand what they're actually reading. And people are nodding their heads so they, they're familiar with this. We need to know words in order to communicate and, or, and in order to understand what we hear and what we read. When students are frustrated with reading, they don't spend the time to learn how to read. And the less time they spend reading, 
um, they, they don't learn words. Um, there's a direct correlation between how much time you spend reading and um, your vocabulary. Comprehension is the end game. It's the ultimate goal. It's why we learn to read. But when a student struggles with comprehension, um, they may struggle with any number of deficits. They may struggle with phonemic awareness. They may struggle with phonics. They may struggle with fluency. They may struggle with vocabulary. And so it's important to understand why or what is the child's reading problem, because if you don't understand what's causing the problem, you're not going to be able to provide the child the intervention or the specially designed instruction the child needs to overcome that problem. RTI, um, response to intervention, is now known, I think, as MTSS. Since I'm speaking about reading, I'm going to refer to it as RTI, the acronym RTI. And RTI is about prevention through early intervention. It's intended to prevent, prevent academic failure by keeping a child at or near grade level. So children who have difficulty learning to read, and I'm, I'm, this is all about reading, it's not writing, it's not math, um, but it's applicable to math and writing, but children who have difficulty learning to read uh, through RTI are identified through a screening process and then provided with research-based interventions. Um, as part of RTI, their progress is monitored frequently, and the reason why is the data that the teachers collect based upon the child's progress or lack thereof informs the teacher about the intensity or the duration of the interventions. And when implemented with fidelity, in other words, when people know what they're doing, and it's implemented consistently and accurately, um, a child may not need special education. When misused or misapplied, um, RTI can also delay or deny needed special education evaluations. These are the basic components of, of an RTI. Um, and the scientific research-based instruction means that all students in the school will receive an effective instructional program. Um, so what that means is it's proven to be successful for most students. Um, otherwise, if you have a program that's not successful for most students, you have to come up with a different instructional program uh, because no one is benefiting. Um, another component is that of RTI is progress monitoring, which is the careful review of data, performance data for all students. Uh, it includes tracking and recording a student's pro um, progress in specific learning areas such as reading. Um, scientifically proven interventions uh, this is what's provided the child who's struggling. And the purpose of these interventions is to target the student's skill deficits, such as phonemic awareness, remediate the problem, and prevent the problem from becoming worse. Um, another component is that parents should be informed uh, when school begins RTI for their child. Um, Parents should receive regular updates about the child's progress. And I think it's also intended or envisioned as an opportunity for collaboration between the school and the parent um, by giving parent enough information so that they can promote their child's success at home. When a child does not benefit or respond to RTI, then the child with the parent's consent should be referred for a special educational evaluation. In the special education world, a psychoeducational evaluation is a comprehensive evaluation that tests the child's intelligence, academic uh, achievement, and adaptive behavior skills. The psychoeducational evaluation helps the IEP team determine what the problem is, 
and what the child needs. Um, intelligence tests, which are one component of psychoeducational evaluations, such as the Wexler, provides a full-scale IQ based upon measuring different skills that reflect on a child's ability to think, to learn, and to solve problems. Academic achievement tests, such as the woodcock Johnson, is another component of a psychoeducational evaluation, and they measure a variety of the child's uh, academic skills in reading, in math, and in writing. Sometimes these tests indicate the need for further assessment because the tests identify a problem, but you need further assessments to tease out the specific problem in the academic area. And the remaining examples are examples of reading assessments that address specific skill areas. A struggling reader is not going to catch up without a reading assessment because an assessment informs instruction. The assessment is used to target areas of strength and weaknesses and then specifically tease out the specific deficit that needs to be addressed. This is the PowerPoint I probably struggled with the most. I did not take statistics. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, the takeaway of this, uh, this PowerPoint slide is ask questions. Um, if you're ever in an IEP meeting and they're reviewing psychoeducational evaluations. These evaluations consist of subtests, um, measuring different skills, abilities, such as word attack skills, such as vocabulary and reading comprehension. When a team reports a composite score, which is the combination of two, different, two or more different subtests, um, sometimes that doesn't provide you with accurate information. Because say, for example, you have a subtest where the child's decoding skills are great, but the child's comprehension skills are terrible. Well, the composite score is going to indicate, oh, the child reads at an average level. And that's not true. So anytime there is variety in subtest scores, it's an indication that you need more information and that there's a problem. Similarly, subtest scatter, when you have a Wexler that provides a child with a full scale IQ, if there's a lot of variation in the scores among the subtests, that's a reason to do um, further assessment because the child has specific weaknesses and the child has specific strengths and you need to know which, er which is the child's area of need. Standard score um, is based, and it's not listed here, but it's based on a bell curve lexicon that is not within the scope of this presentation. Um, but I raise it because if you're at an IEP meeting and somebody says the child's standard score is 85, how many people think that's a good score? Oh, well then you know more than I did. Um, what that represents is a percentile rank of 16%, which means 84% of the children scored better. Um, yes? Standard deviations, they, yes, and, but I can't give you the relationship of the standard deviations, you know, um, uh, but, but it would be in the, within the same conversation. Um, so with the standard score, the takeaway is ask for the percentile rank at, or ask for the age and grade equivalent scores because they describe a student's performance based on age or grade equivalent scores for other students. So my example would be, be is better explaining it this than the words I'm using right now. If a 12-year-old has been given an age equivalent of 7.5, 7 that means his skills are equivalent to a child who is seven years and five months. And so it's, it's what they call norm reference tests, which means you're assessing the child 
ba um, um, based upon the performance among his age group or grade, greater group. And people are nodding their heads good. The IEP is the raison d'etre. It is the roadmap for describing what's going on with the child, why the child needs special education services, and what the school is going to do in response to the child's educational needs. There are several components to the IEP, but in the context of reading, the two I want to focus on are called present level of academic achievement and functional performance, uh, elegantly known as PLEP. Um, it used to be present level of educational performance, and so I'm going to refer to it as the PLEP. And that is the starting point for developing the child's IEP because it describes the child's educational performance and provides a baseline for measurement. Based upon the child's PLEP, um, the IEP team develops annual goals. And the annual goals target what the child will learn and how the child's progress will be measured. And so the next slide explains exactly what I mean. We have gone to many IEP meetings where the PLEP, the present level of educational performance, will say, John is struggling with reading. Can anyone volunteer why that may not be a good present level of educational performance? You said not specific. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're right. We, do, we really don't know what's going on, and we really don't know why he's having difficulty with reading. So the rewrite tells us what's going on, tells us why he's having um, difficulty with reading, and also provides a baseline for measurement. And the baseline for measurement becomes important in developing the goal. So the goal, John will improve his reading skills. Um, the same problems. It's not specific. We don't know what he's going to achieve. And we don't know how to measure what progress he makes which is why you have the two, now you can have several goals under one um, academic area. And the rewrite gives you a basis for measurement. We know if he's in fifth grade and he's currently reading on a first grade level, the team is anticipating that he will make progress to grade levels. Um, and the team is also saying what services he will need to address what needs he has. To relevant and realistic IEP goals not only address the child's need resulting from the disability, but it helps us know when the child actually makes progress. These are cases that I included in your PowerPoint because they underscore some of the principles of, of this presentation. Um, the Rowley case is a Supreme Court case. It is the North Star for special education litigation because it establishes the requirements for FAPE, a free appropriate public education. And the court in general states, a state satisfies the FAPE requirements when a child benefits from the instruction he receives. Now, <laughs> there's been a lot of litigation about how much benefit constitutes fate. Um, and the Fourth Circuit, which we're under, states can't be trivial. Um, and there really is a divide. Um, one uh, swath of states or circuits say it has to be meaningful progress. Um, Another swath of states say it has to be some progress. But we know, based upon uh, Florence's case, gives you an example of what's not appropriate. Now, again, this is all fact-specific. So um, the courts have not, neither the law nor 
litigation defines exactly what a free appropriate public education means because it's always so fact specific. But in Florence, which is a Supreme Court case, we know what FAPE isn't. And in this case, um, the court held that four months of progress in reading during a school year doesn't constitute FAPE. It's not enough. Um, Draper, which was another case, the court pointed out that nothing in IDEA precludes an award of compensatory education in the form of private school placement. Um, this was an egregious set of facts uh, where the school system in Georgia was required to provide compensatory education as a remedy which consisted of $38,000 a year in a private school placement. Um, and this was going back seven years ago. Um, not only did the school system fail to identify the child's learning disabilities for five years, they placed him in a classroom with no understanding of support for his reading disabilities and then for three years um, used interventions that didn't work. So I mean, you're talking about like eight years of educational um, neglect. The Ravenswood um, I included because uh, the court held that the IEP was not calculated to provide a student with FAPE because it wasn't based upon clear baselines of present level of performance. The court held that concise and clearly understandable data should have been included in the student's present level of educational performance so his progress could have been um, evaluated. Um, and so again, that goes into this, the, the requirement for specificity and the ability to measure progress. The last case, um, the parent wasn't uh, held to be the prevailing party because the court found this, the school system's uh, reading program was um, provided FAPE, but I included it because part of the school's uh, court's thinking about approving the school's reading program is that it was based upon peer research. So in other words, peer review is an indicator that a program is scientific and research based. So that concludes my remarks on literacy and unless anyone has specific questions, yeah. The, the phone? Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I apologize because I don't know all the technical oh, terms, yeah. but like um, fluency and um, what is it, phonics basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what, where does culture kind of come in sometimes with that type of development mm -hmm. and um, for parents knowing what, you know, if the plans that come out of it is culturally conscious of those things and culturally sensitive. And I don't know if there's any sensitivity around that, but um, I, I know that by age, uh, by the third grade is the indicator, you know, in yeah. terms of what happens with some of uh, young adults, but in the first, second, third grades that they're struggling and maybe it's families that come from another culturally linguistic. Um, oh, I mean, it's a continuum yeah. of reasons how cultural competence, see, I think it's important for the teachers and the evaluators to assess that but I, I don't know the answer to your question. It's a factor, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a factor in IQ tests. It's a factor, you know, there, tests only measure some skills. They don't measure all skills. It's like, you know, we can have a debate from now until kingdom come. Well, really, what do intelligent tests measure? They don't measure creativity. They don't measure uh, imagination. They don't measure uh, humor. They don't measure resiliency. So, so it's, it, you, you, it's one source of information. Um, but I, uh, but I, I'm, I apologize, I don't know the answer to your, to your real question. And just one more question. Do you, um, a, lot, a lot of the families sometimes that we work with, they don't trust the school. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to testing, the list of tests that you gave and things, mm -hmm. um, what are some, I guess, good practices or whatever, maybe that they can get their pediatrician involved in to maybe make a referral for them to get um, testing done so that they can bring in their own data and information? All right, that question triggers a lot of uh, questions. Um, in terms of the IEP meeting itself, 
parent has a right to bring someone who's knowledgeable and to help them ask questions. Parent, in special ed law, the parent has the right to request an independent evaluation if they disagree with the school's assessment or they don't think the school's assessment is adequate. That triggers a certain number of steps. But, um, but I would encourage using the school evaluations as a basis for determining whether you need further evaluations or not. And any evaluations you do have from the outside, similarly any evaluations you should have from the school system should be shared with the treating professionals. Um, because the presumption is everybody's working on the same side, toward the same goal. Well, yeah. I have a question about RTI here. So is RTI done in third grade? Or so if a student comes into kindergarten, because um, you talked yeah. about you know, learning to read and reading to learn. So if a student comes into kindergarten already with a diagnos diagnosis of an ID, then do we apply RTI or do we stick them into a special education um, classroom without an evaluation to see what research-based yeah. intervention would work? RTI is intended to apply, my understanding, is it intended to apply to all students. The presumption is they have a research-based instructional program that all children are going to receive. Now, as part of that, they monitor the child's progress. And because of that progress monitoring, they're able to identify children who are struggling. Those children will receive what they call um, targeted interventions. And that could take the form of one-to-one, -one, small groups. Um, so it's not an automatic uh, referral to special education, especially you know, at that age, I mean, I mean, there are some exceptions. If you have chi a child who has gone through early intervention services and now is going into a school system and has an individualized family support plan, then you're going to have an IEP meeting. But if you have, but if children, I mean, children progress at different rates uh, developmentally, um, and I, I think the idea is you have a wide net. You, you start out with a research-based instructional program where they know most students are going to benefit. And those that struggle, they become, so they start you know, wide and then become more diagnostic. And so that's the, the, that's the norm here, that you start with research-based uh, even in special education? Yeah, I'm telling you how it's supposed to operate. Oh. I bet it varies from school system to school system to school system. Um, okay. well, I just I wanted to piggyback on that, and, and basically that's how my system has worked with my child, is that it started out in first grade with looking at um, where her challenges were and putting some um, strategic things in place to help her with that, and we just sort of went along and saw, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and as it progressed and we realized that, you know, these things weren't solving the problem, getting her to the level that she needed to be, then we step up to the evaluation and, and going with the IEP. And, and I think that is exactly how it was. She's not horribly far behind. Mm -hmm. You know, we were hoping that those strategies <coughs> would work, but they did not. And I, I thought of this earlier. One of the things that I wanted to say was um, I deal with a lot of families and a lot of school systems who have lots of challenges with the school systems providing the things that they need. And I've had families that have been told, you know, we're really sorry, but everything that we've done has not worked, so your child has reached a plateau, so we're not going to try to do anything else. And I am incredibly fortunate that the team that I have um, looked at me and said, we've tried a lot of things, and they haven't worked so far, so we're going to find some more things to try. Because obviously we're not doing something right. It's not your child that can't learn. It's that we're not finding the right intervention, the right strategies to teach your child. So I think that's incredibly important to know. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And yeah, I just want to clarify. If, if your child is already EC, um, which I think is what you're saying, <coughs> then you would not have to go through RTI again to get intervention. Resource classroom, self-contained classroom, something of that nature would be in play um, if the child's identified. So 
it's only un, it, it's only with children who are being identified um, and children who have not been identified in a particular area of LD where there may be consideration of moving them back through processes to look at those children. Say, say they were identified learning disabled in math and they, and they continue to have reading problems. Um, th there may be a process where we move them back through that RTI component again to make sure that it's not instruction and it's not the curriculum that's causing the problem, but that they really have difficulty in reading um, that is based in, in, as an LD uh, part of their disability. So, so again, if your child's in kindergarten and they come in, they would go straight into special education programming. I, I just want to make sure, because that, that, I don't think we're that much different than Pennsylvania in that regard. Thank you for that clarification. I want to move on, and if we can take questions at the end, or, um, th that would be good. Good morning, I'm Virginia Fogg. Um, I'm the newest attorney on the special education team at Disability Rights North Carolina, and I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm happy to see everyone here who is working so hard to um, support um, children with special education needs and to help improve their outcomes. Um, so our portion of the program um, is now going to turn to um, behavior in the context of special education. And, um, we chose to talk about um, behavior at this year because um, many, many of our cases come with behavioral issues and components that we um, have to help resolve in order to help the child continue to make progress um, academically and socially and emotionally and in all those other realms that are important for independent living, which is the ultimate goal for any child um, with an IEP. Um, and when we think about behavior in the context of a child who has an IEP, um, and, and in some cases also a 504 plan, um, we're, we're thinking about situations where behavior is impeding their learning. And that can be a situation where they are actually being suspended from school on a regular basis and have been suspended for more than 10 calendar days in the school year. or where the parent is being called frequently to pick the child up from school and a formal suspension or office write-up is not occurring, but um, they are still missing out academically and in effect, they are being suspended even though it's not being written down that way. Um, or where they're simply not accessing the general curriculum. They're sitting in the classroom, um, but they're, they're not actually able to take in what's, what's being taught and to participate and to make progress academically. And in those situations, um, the standard in IDEA of FAPE, which every child is entitled to a free appropriate public education, um, FAPE says that if behavior is impeding the child's learning, then you need to take some steps and to, to look at what the problem is. And um, those situations again occur when the child um, is being suspended because of their disability or if they're suspended and the IEP team determines that the action that they caused the suspension was not related to their disability and they're removed and put in a different educational placement because of you know, either long-term suspended or moved to the alternative school, you still trigger um, some protections under IDEA. Um, and again, if they're impeding the student's education or if they're not able to benefit from their special, special education services, including related services like speech or OT. So you could have a situation where the student is um, not able to make the transition from the classroom that they spend most of their day in to go to the OT's room to work on their fine motor skills. And those types of trans they're, therefore they're not able to benefit from their IEP services. And so you need to then look at what do we need to do to help this behavior diminish enough so that then they can get the services that they need. I would say that overall, when we're thinking about behavior in the context of IDEA and the FAPE requirement, we are presuming that the behavior has a function 
and it's a form of communication from the student. And that the child is behaving in a particular way because there's a need that's not being met. And it's really important, I think, to think of it conceptually in that way because it helps you to then take the step back or several steps back you need to take from the emotional, emotionally charged situation um, that you have when a child is being suspended frequently where the school staff is you know, frustrated and have kind of thrown up their hands, where the parents are frustrated, um, where the student is in a situation where they are not happy at school and don't like going to school. It's important to, to, to back off a little bit and to start look at th looking at it more as not just what did the child do, but why did the child do this. And the, the two tools that um, we um, are given under IDEA for dealing with these situations are FBAs and BIPs. And an FBA is a functional behavior assessment. And again, that's the beginning process of looking at the behavior to determine what, what is the root cause of the behavior? What is the child trying to tell you by having this behavior? And then the second step, the second tool is a BIP, a behavior intervention plan. And the plan uses the information that you glean from the FBA to then put in um, positive supports and services and interventions to diminish the behavior and hopefully extinguish the behavior. Um, and the plan is, and Lisa's going to talk more about behavior intervention plans in depth, but the plan, um, one thing we want to make sure everybody understands, it, it's not a behavior contract. Um, it's not a list of statements of what the child will and will not do with the child's initials out beside them and a, and a signature at the bottom. Um, this is much more complex and it's based on um, people's natural responses to certain situations and in this case the individualized responses of this particular child um, because of their disability um, to situations that um, are recurring at school and are triggering adverse behaviors that are then leading to um, suspensions and time out of the classroom. And it, under IDEA, again, um, when a student is long-term suspended, which is anything more than 10 days on a calendar school year, um, they are, um, you, the IEP team needs to meet and to start the process for an, uh, an FBA and a BIP. And that's, that occurs whether you get a positive manifestation determination or a negative manifestation determination uh, outcome at that meeting. And I don't have time today to go into manifestation determination reviews, but I encourage you all to look at your um, policies and procedures that you can find on the DPI website. Um, and if you haven't looked at those, they're incredibly valuable. They are very understandable and readable. They have an index and a table of contents, um, which we are all very appreciative of and um, and they um, it's under the EC tab on the DPI website. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about some specific situations um, about when you're looking at a functional behavior assessment. What are best practices? Um, sometimes, if you are the parent going into um, an IEP team and meeting and you're requesting an FBA, um, you know. Not every IEP team may have done these or may not have done very many of them, and you're going to have to educate people on what the best practices are. And the same thing goes for the school staff. You're going to have to educate the parent on the process and, and what, what's really required. So some of the things that we think make for good FBAs are, again, going back and suspending your judgment. Um, everybody taking a few steps back about, about you know, why you're so frustrated and Usually when you're at this point of doing an FBA, um, people are pointing fingers at each other and um, blaming the child and blaming the parent and blaming the school staff. And in general, that's just not helpful um, when you're doing an FBA. You need, you need to remove yourself um, from that, that process. And then the team needs to prioritize areas of concern. Frequently, you have a child um, who has you know, eight or nine different behaviors at school that, that you need to curb in order for them to be able to stay in the classroom and to attend to the tasks that are presented to him or her. And unfortunately, it's difficult to actually 
you know, address effectively all of those areas of concern. So the team needs to talk about what are the things that are the biggest problems right now. And, and to try, try to get those down to two or three, maybe four, um, if some of them overlap. But in general, um, I think teams feel like two or three is, is about what an FBA um, can handle. And then you need to identify and define the behavior. Um, and so, and we're gonna use some, have some examples of these in just a minute. So I'm gonna go through these a little quickly um, and then we'll talk about them again when we get to the specific example. And then the next step is that somebody from the school um, needs to observe the child and collect data across settings. And what this means is that the child needs to be observed not just in the particular class that they might be having a problem with, if it's only a specific class or classes, but across different settings during the day, in structured activities and unstructured activities, in specials at recess and PE, because that's where you're gonna get the data to help you hone in and determine what the trigger is for this particular um, behavior. Yes, did you have a question? Yes, I think that, that can happen if that's what the parent would like to happen. Um, and, and then that report can be offered at the um, IEP meeting by the parent or the social worker could attend the IEP meeting and, and let them know what they saw. I've seen some very, very good um, FBAs and BIPs done um, by, by social workers in those settings and then they become very informative and helpful in the team meeting. Essentially, as long as it's good information, the more information that you have from different sources, the better. I think. So, um, and sometimes I, I think that it, when FBAs occur at school, this observing the child across settings um, gets skipped a little bit. And peop, you go in and they say, okay, we're gonna do an FBA today. And what that means is people are gonna tell you what they know anecdotally and what they've seen. And they're you're gonna look at the suspensions and what the actual behavior was but that's not really an FBA. That's not looking at the trigger um, behind the behavior, um, the settings that it occurred in. Another thing that I think is very important, and it's a little difficult sometimes, but I think it's worth the time and the effort, is to have somebody that the child does not know observe them. Because frequently, um, somebody is most convenient and it's understandable to have somebody from the school staff go in and watch the child in math class and walk into the lunchroom and, and watch the child and you know go into the literacy class. But often the child knows they're being watched. Um, even if you think they don't know they're being watched, we find out later they know they're being watched. And so then the data that's being taken about the how many times the child is off task or how many times they're disrupting um, the class is, is not actually helpful behavior. And a good FBA can, can help you write BIPs for years to come. It should be repeated um, you know, over the course of time, but if you do it right one time, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna yield some really good results. Okay, so then after the observations occur, and hopefully they've occurred um, correctly, then um, EC staff or um, perhaps a guidance counselor needs to talk to the child and the um, parents and anybody else who's involved, again, that could be the social worker, to gather information about the um, child's needs and how they're behaving in other situations outside of school and, in, and you know, in different teachers' classes. And then um, the information gets reviewed and the team analyzes the data. Um, and so now I think we're gonna, um, and then it, you're gonna write a hypothesis and we'll explain the hypothesis in just a second. Okay, so we're gonna have um, our example here that Lisa and I came up with um, is Annie. And Annie is a seventh grader with a fourth grade reading level. And at this point, Annie um, still is willing to go to school. She's not refusing to get up in the morning, not refusing to get on the bus or get out of the car. Um, but when she is at school, she avoids starting work. She's not finishing her work. Um, she's teasing and bullying her peers during class, and she's making many off-topic comments in class. Okay, and as a result of this, um, she is, um, we have a pattern of out-of-school suspensions now, she hasn't been suspended for 10 days in a row or 11 days in a row, 
but she's gotten um, a total, as you can see there, of several short-term suspensions that are now um, totaling 15 days out of school. So at this point, we have definitely triggered not only an MDR um, meeting at school to determine whether she should still be suspended for these behaviors, but also um, the obligation to do an FBA and a BIP. She's missing instructional time and she's losing friends. Okay, so then the team is, is convened and it's time to write Annie's FBA. So we have to start out with identifying and defining the behavior. And in this case, the team decides that Annie um, avoids starting assignments, fails to complete assignments, and makes off-topic comments and teases and bullies her classmates during class. Those are the behaviors that we're going to address through the FBA and the BIP for Annie. There may be other behaviors, but these are the ones that are causing the most problem. Okay, and then in Annie's case, there were observations that were done across settings by somebody that she did not know, and um, they found that she exhibited the behaviors during language arts and social studies, but not during math, music, or recess. Okay, and then there are um, information gathering um, about Annie. The guidance counselor talks separately with Annie, her parents, and her teachers about her experience at school. Okay, and then the EC staff reviews and writes a summary of the information in preparation for the next meeting about the BIP. Usually you cannot do, I mean, sorry, the FBA. Usually you cannot do an FBA in one meeting because you have to identify and define the behavior and then somebody has to go out and do the observations. And, and often those get condensed down into one and you miss out on that important step um, of, of really going through the process correctly. So the EC staff wrote a summary of Annie's formal and informal evaluations. Um, some of those could have already been done with her IEP. Some of them may have been done as part of the FBA. Um, the data that the observer collected, um, her suspension history, and other information that the guidance counselor learned. So then the team gets to the point where they need to figure out what the trigger is for these adverse behaviors. And based on what we know, that she only has these behaviors in language arts and social studies, which are very reading uh, intensive classes, but not in less reading intensive classes like math, music, and recess, the um, team determines that um, the trigger is reading and the consequences are that she's trying to avoid the reading tasks that are too difficult and she's, um, because she can't do them and she's trying to avoid embarrassment in front of her peers and teachers. So the hypothesis that the team comes up with based on all of this information is that she avoids starting assignments, fails to complete assignments, and makes off-topic comments and teases and bullies her classmates during class to avoid reading tasks that are too difficult for her and to avoid embarrassment about her reading level. And that essentially is the FBA. Um, and it's not overly complex, but it does have several steps in it. But if I think um, when you're working on it, if you take it step by step, then um, at one step at a time, then you do come up with, with a very good hypothesis to then start working on a BIP. And now I'm going to turn the BIP portion of the presentation over to Lisa Raven. I am going to talk about behavior intervention plans. And I'm going to do it rather quickly because I see we have about six or seven minutes left. Um, let's see if I can make my behavior intervention plans. Okay, what is a behavior intervention plan? A behavior intervention plan is an individualized plan, which is very important that it's individualized, to support the student in order to help him or her modify or replace certain behaviors. It consists of positive strategies that emphasize skills needed to behave in a more appropriate manner. The two very important keys there are individualized and positive. As Jenny said, it's not a behavior contract. It should be positive. It should help the child find replacement behaviors and behave in a more appropriate manner so there aren't suspensions, juvenile court, court referrals. Uh, it doesn't need to be cookie cutter. It doesn't need to be the same plan for, for every kid and change it a little bit here and there. It really needs to be individualized. Okay. 
why develop a behavior intervention plan? Well, as we talked about, the student has behaviors that impede his or her learning or the learning of other students and, and most likely the learning of other students in the classroom as well. They need additional supports and interventions to modify that behavior. And this is an important one, that teachers and school personnel also need the guidance in order to properly manage those behaviors. If a student has behaviors uh, significant enough to disrupt their learning or the learning of others, then you should go ahead and look at a behavior intervention plan. We know we have to do one if they've reached more than 10 days out of school. However, it'd be very smart to go ahead, if you see this happening and you're getting close to that, to go ahead and talk with the IEP team about maybe developing a behavior intervention plan so that we don't get to that 10 days, so that we don't get to a juvenile court referral. It can be done and, and lots of times probably should be done ahead of that. Uh, a BIP is necessary to avoid those behaviors that lead to dis, dis, uh, suspensions and disruption of learning. And there are a variety of supports and interventions that can be put into place to modify that behavior. Um, the guidance for teachers is important. Um, a lot of times we have to look at the way we respond to a child's behavior and how that affects that child's behavior. I think about this all the time with my own children and how they do something and how I respond to them. Is this going to get what I'm looking for, which is a replacement behavior or not to do that anymore, or is it just going to make things worse the way I respond? So a lot of times teachers having guidance on, on what, how is appropriate to talk to that child, the things that should do with that child is important. Yes? putting in place in the IEP before there's even, I mean, we're, we're on this road. There's been no suspension or anything, but I clearly, this is my child all day long. Um, and we're getting ready to write the IEP. Is this something that you can go ahead and start that conversation and put positive things in place, even if there haven't been issues? issues? Yeah, and, and let me go to the next slide real quick. What should a BIP include? Um, and I'll go ahead and put all these up. So. Um, yes, that, I think that is a good thing to have that discussion with an IEP team because uh, you can put things into place. If, you know, behavior plans a lot of times have things like um, teaching coping strategies, social skills, uh, supports, you know, that's not punishment but modified assignments if the child needs another, a different assignment or if, you know, if the seventh grader and reading on a fourth grade level, then obviously there's going to be some issues there. And if you modify the assignments, you let the child ask for modified assignments. There's so many different strategies that can be put into place. And you can go ahead and do that. If, if we know that's going to be a problem, I don't see any reason not to go ahead and have a plan. And it doesn't necessarily maybe have to be in a behavior intervention plan per se, but have that discussion in an IEP team meeting to say, you know, my child maybe need, might need a break, you know, might need a five minute break. A lot of times we have a go-to person in the school that kids will have that they like this one teacher, they get along well, so if these disruptions start happening and, and then you go to that, that person. So yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason not to do that if you know that that's, you know, if that's happening, if it's starting to happen. You can do it proactively and not just react to a 10 day suspension. Okay. We, I know we're getting close. Um, and a BIP does take time to work. It's not going to be the first week of the behavior intervention plan and this child's not having any more problems. It is going to take time and you're going to probably have to work through it and change some things. So let's go on and look at the behavior intervention plan. Oh. And then you're going to have the steps to be taken when inappropriate behaviors occur, which is very important. That's going to be a list of what you do when the child starts acting out. But a behavior intervention plan for Annie. Well, we have the target behavior problems, which we've already discussed, completing classroom assignments of teasing, bullying peers during class, and um, disrupting class with off-topic comments, and it's usually during reading, when there's reading involved. You're going to want to put the objectives of the behavior intervention plan are going to be to complete assignments, to decrease the teasing of, of her peers during class, and to participate in reading without disrupting herself, her learning, or the learning of other students. It's important that she actually learn something and not just sit there, so we want her to actually be learning. 
not just not teasing and not bullying kids. Uh, the next thing, I'm sorry. It's preventive strategies. Like we talked about, there could be modified assignments. There could be allowing Annie to request assignments if she thinks it's too difficult or too challenging. Uh, preferential seating close to the teacher may help with the bullying or the teasing of other kids. Uh, this one's important, additional assessments in reading. So we know where she is and, and what, what we're, how she's progressing and see what we can do to help her increase her reading level. And extra help with academic coursework. That could be done after school. If she needs it, she should feel like she's able to get that help. Okay, then you'll have what alternative behaviors are we looking for, and this is fairly quick. Annie will ask for help when assignment, when it's too demanding, and she will raise her hand and be called upon for appropriate comments. Very important here is positive reinforcement. Verbal praise from a teacher. I don't know any kid that doesn't like to hear that they're doing something well instead of you're not doing something well. Uh, tangible rewards for completing assignments. Extra time with a preferred activity such as computer or recess, something of that nature. And a positive note home. Never seen my kids happier than when they come home with a positive office referral and they can't even get in the car at carpool before they're showing it to me. So th this, I mean, you, you know, a lot of times we'll get the negative note home if your kid's having behavior problems. A positive note can, can help that kid tremendously. It's, and it is important in that part with the like the tangible rewards, make sure it's something the child has input in this behavior plan and it's something that that child likes because uh, it's not going to help to give a child extra recess if they don't like to go outside and play. That's not something they're going to be working for. You have to have the consequences for noncompliance. And this is, should be followed and should be followed in order um, and should be followed across the board by all the teachers. You don't want there to be one teacher who says, if the child, if Andy becomes off task, they provide nonverbal cues to redirect. If you have a teacher that goes straight to this last one, which is office referral, was, instead of doing the steps that are uh, that are laid out in the behavior intervention plan, the child's not the behavior intervention plan is not going to help. It's just not. It, you got to have consistency, and you got to have consistency across the board. It's important that everybody who deals with Annie, in this case, knows she has a behavior plan and follows that plan. It's important to have that consistency. It's important that everybody be on board with it, parents included at home. If the child's having a bad day at school and they come home and they get to play Xbox and watch television, well, that's not going to help anything because they're not getting that at home. The punishment, I mean, not the punishment, but they're not getting, um, they're getting reward for not doing what we'd like for them to do. In conclusion, because I think we are past our time, um, BIPs can be reevaluated whenever a team member feels, an IEP team member feels that a review is necessary. Um, if the behavior, the BIP plan is not improving the behaviors, then you're going to want to look at it and see what's not working and what, what can be changed. If um, the targeted behavior changes, and, I, and we see this a lot. We'll do a great behavior plan, and then all of a sudden something else starts happening, and it's not the you know bullet teasing the peers anymore. It gets to be something else, and you got to go back and look at that behavior intervention plan. And as Jenny said, if a manifestation determination review is held, the IEP team, of course, meets to review that. And there's our contact information, and um, we'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, now until somebody makes us leave <laughs> or outside if anybody has any questions.